everyone. Thank you. <laughs> and welcome to the 2019 presentation of the RBC Bronwyn Wallace Award for Emerging Writers. Yes, yeah, that's great. My name is Sheila Rogers. I host a program called The Next Chapter on CBC Radio where we feature writing. Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to tell you, I'm, I'm heading into my 40th year at the CBC, uh, and somebody stuck an extra zero on it, and uh, so, you know, there are days when it does feel like 400 years, but every day has been different. I'm very delighted to be your MC this evening. I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we're gathered. It's the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the Potomac First Nations, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. I'd also like to acknowledge the Métis presence that has been on this land for many years as well. And with respect, we honor their traditions, ways of knowing, ways of being, which continue to this day. Well. Um, and we're, we're very grateful to be able to assemble on this territory to celebrate something that's as exciting as these wonderful emerging writers. During the reception, and just right up until like 10 seconds ago, we had the pleasure of listening to Ralphie Altuni and Ralphie. Ralphie, thank you so much. And Ralphie, Ralphie's on the faculty of the Royal Conservatory uh, of, as, a, as an examiner. And he's also a recording artist and producer. Rafi's musical diversity has led him to a performing career that has included concerts and television and radio performance throughout Canada and the United States. And we're delighted to have him playing here today. It really adds so much and makes us feel so welcome. So thank you again, Rafi, very much. And now to the main event. The 2019 RBC Bronwyn Wallace Award, 25th Anniversary Edition. This evening, we celebrate three deeply talented young writers who are the finalists for the 2019 award. Please join me in a round of applause for Rebecca Salazar, Ellie Sawatsky, and John Elizabeth Stinson. <laughs> All three finalists deserve recognition and readers. And I know we're going to be hearing from them in the future, and we'll be hearing from them in the very near future, as each one of them reads from their nominated works. You can also read their stories on iBooks or pick up a booklet when you leave this evening. This award has celebrated the bright future of Canadian literature for 24 years, and it's named in honor of Brahman Wallace, who was a poet short story writer, essayist, a bold essayist, and a mentor to many young writers. Mary Osborne, the executive director of the Writers' Trust, will say more about the trust and how it supports this award in just a moment. But first I'd like to speak a little bit about Bronwyn Wallace. Bronwyn was, was my friend, uh, and I got to know her in Kingston, Ontario, but in fact, she knew me before I knew her because uh, she and her husband, Chris, would watch the late night weather forecast at CKWS where I was the wacky weather woman. And uh, <laughs> in another way that Bronwyn was ahead of her time, I gather that there might have been marijuana involved as well. I'm sure it just it, it made the experience a lot better. Um, we did a series together on a program called The Arts Tonight that was about the life of a writer and what it was like to, to work in isolation, um, what it was like to mentor uh, younger and emerging writers, not necessarily younger, what it was like to work with people who weren't necessarily writers, but she wanted to, to get their stories from them. And by and large, these were women. Uh, Bronwyn was a, a very firm and uh, pioneering feminist. Um, she wanted to make 
sure that women who uh, had experienced abuse were not looked upon as victims, but as survivors. She wrote their stories. She wrote their lives. She knew their stories. She knew their lives. I remember her for her amazing sense of humor. Uh, Doug Gibson, who is here, knew her very well. Carolyn Smart, her dear friend. Um, she was zany. Uh, she had a, a real eye for fashion. Uh, she wore wonderful earrings. Um, she was helpful. And she really was determined to change the world. Um, I remember having a terrible argument with her once about elections, and Bronwyn didn't vote. And she told me, if you vote, you give the bastards a chance. Uh, however, if you don't vote, you do the very same thing. <clears throat> I, would, I would just like to read a couple of excerpts from her own poetry. Uh, and in her words, she would chart the intricate language of our common cause, whatever holds us together. This is a little bit from a poem called A Simple Poem for Virginia Woolf. This started out as a simple poem for Virginia Woolf. It wasn't going to mention history or choices or women's lives, the complexities of women's friendships, or the countless gritty details of an ordinary woman's life. That never happens to appear in poems at all. Yet even as I write these words, those ordinary details intervene between the poem that I meant to write and this one, where the delicate faces of my children, faces of friends, of women I have never seen, glow on the blank pages and deeper than any silence, press around me, waiting their turn. And this is an excerpt from a poem called Testimonies. Wading through goldenrod to a house where just inside the door, the trunk of old clothes or the chair that didn't make it to the load on back of the truck bears witness to those smaller choices that we all have to make about the future and what can be wisely carried into it. What your work brings you to, I see now, not the past. Each sight a threshold into this slow discovery, the random testimony gathered as best we can each of us down to essentials as the failed art and the dead who bear us forward in their fine, accurate arms. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, we miss her. She, she died of cancer um, way too early. And there's, there's an epigraph in her collection of short stories, People You Trust Your Life To. And it's from Adrian Rich, and it goes, anger and tenderness, my selves. And now I can believe they breathe in me as angels, not polarities. And I think I do have to say how thrilled Bronwyn would be to see the three of you as the emerging poets that have been selected for an award in her name this evening. It would, I know it would thrill her, and I know Carolyn agrees with me, and um, that's, that's a wonderful affirmation. So once again, congratulations to the three of you as you carry this in your resumes for the rest of your life. It's really fantastic. So... Thank you very much for letting me speak about Bronwyn. And, um, and it's so wonderful that her, her influence uh, continues. I'd very much like now to invite Mary Osborne, who's the Executive Director of the Writers Trust of Canada, to the podium to say a few words. Thank you very much, Sheila, and welcome, everybody. We're really happy to have all of you gathered here to celebrate the uh, RBC Bronwyn Wallace Award for Emerging Writers. Uh, usually we're here with the sun shining in the windows. That was not to be tonight or this month or any time we can remember. Um, but I feel like possibly it makes our host, Sheila, feel at home because she is a West Coaster and is used to this kind of thing. Um, 
One, one of the things uh, I wanted to point out is that this award is one of 10 that we do at the Writers' Trust every year, and uh, we have uh, a couple of things coming up, and one of them is one of our prizes that I also wanted to mention to you. Uh, we're going to be in Halifax this weekend. The Writers' Union is doing their conference there, and uh, the Writers' Trust is uh, joining that conference to put on the Margaret Lawrence Lecture that we do every year, where we invite uh, a top Canadian writer to talk on the theme of a writer's life, and all of Senior will be presenting that lecture Friday night in Halifax, and we will also be live streaming it for anyone who would like to tune in. And on Saturday, we'll be, we'll be presenting another literary award, the Dana Ogilvy Prize for Emerging LGBTQ Writers. And um, again, if anybody is in Halifax for the uh, Union's Conference or for any other reason, you're welcome to join us. And otherwise, you can go to our Facebook page and uh, watch the live stream. Uh, the finalists, by the way, for the Dana Ogilvy Prize are Joelle Barron, Lindsay Nixon, and Casey Plett, who got some wonderful news at another event hosted by Sheila last week. Um, I uh, also wanted to talk a little bit about another event that we have that is in Toronto in June, and uh, it is a showcase of the rising stars. And uh, so the Writers' Trust started a program that was just announced in April, uh, Writers Trust Rising Stars, and we have five established writers who um, have each selected one up-and-coming writer who they think has the ability to create enduring work, and um, we have put together a whole range of activities for them, um, including um, a mentorship with the person who selected them, uh, a two-week stay at the BAMP Centre, and a series of events in Toronto over the course of two days. And that will culminate in an event at the AGO. Um, the event is free, but you do need to reserve tickets online. So you can go to our website for that, or you can talk to me or anybody else on the staff when we finish up uh, and start uh, drinking after this event is uh, wrapped up. <laughs> Um, I wanted to take a moment to thank uh, some of the people who make this event possible. There are just so many people who go into it, um, who put effort into it. Um, so to start with, I wanted to thank the RBC Foundation. Uh, Amy, thank you very much. Um, I've said it before, but RBC has been such a great sponsor of this prize and has really taken it to places that we would never have been able to done do without their support. Um, many of you know that we doubled the prize amount last year and um, were able to put on a really nice celebration for emerging writers and have them supported all the way through. And so uh, thank you very much to the RBC Foundation. Uh, I'd also like to thank Carolyn Smart, who's sitting in the front row beside Sheila. Uh, Carolyn uh, established this prize in honor of her friend, as uh, Sheila noted, and uh, Carolyn and I had some of the same conversations about the same kind of things that uh, Sheila was just sharing about how this would have just meant so much to Bronwyn to see what this prize has become, uh, to see the group of writers this year, but also over the 25 years, the number of writers who have been impacted by this program, uh, all of the work they've gone on to do that has been so meaningful, and more recently, um, adding a mentorship component to, her, to it, which was something that, um, as Sheila pointed out, is something that was really important to Bronwyn. Um, so I would like to thank the um, mentors who are, uh, have met with or are meeting with our um, finalists, uh, who are Kinesia Lubrin, Nimash, and Lee Nash, and Carmen Sternino. Uh, I'd also like to thank the jurors who put so much time and effort into careful reading and deliberation of the work of uh, well over 100 uh, submissions and um, came up with the three finalists. Uh, they are Jordan Abel, Sue Goyette, and Emma Healy. So a round of applause for the jurors. I'd also like to say that this has been an extremely busy spring for everybody at the Writers' Trust, and I want to say a huge thank you to the staff. Uh, so um, beginning with Devin Jackson, I will say happy birthday. Um, and, uh, I would also uh, like to say a big welcome to Julia Yu, who is the most recent addition to our staff and who worked on putting this event together. Uh, but it's really an entire team event. So uh, James Davies, our program director, 
uh, Katrina Afonso, our digital manager, Kayla Calder, uh, our development manager. And then we have one staff member um, who really thinks of this event as her baby, and that is Amanda Hopkins, who, oh, I just spotted her. Um, <laughs> So um, Amanda is on maternity leave and dealing with her own actual baby, but I'm glad to see her here still uh, watching over this event. Uh, so I would like to thank all of you so much for joining us. I would like to say another huge congratulations to the finalists. Uh, we're really excited for all of you and wish you all good things in the future. And uh, I hope uh, all of you enjoy the readings and the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, and um, I, I'd also like to acknowledge the hard work that Mary has done to make the Writers' Trust of Canada, to put the Canada really into the Writers' Trust of Canada. It feels so national now, so congratulations to you as well. Yeah, it's time. <laughs> it's time to turn the stage over to you. In alphabetical order, I'm going to invite each finalist to read from their nominated work. Rebecca Salazar is currently a poetry editor for the Fiddlehead and Plenitude magazines and a PhD candidate at the University of New Brunswick. In their citation, the jurors wrote that Rebecca's poems serve to speak truth where truth has been silenced, to rupture that silence, to disrupt that silence. Please welcome Rebecca to read from <laughs> your public body. Hi. Uh, thank you to Sheila and to everyone for having us here. Um, to Carolyn for the first phone call also, <laughs> um, which happened about a month before we knew about anything else. Um, so it's been a few months building in anticipation for this. Uh, I'm going to read the first poem from my uh, selection, and I'm going to ask you to bear with me because I'm doing something experimental with a bell. It's a bike bell, um, and I've never tried this one before. <laughs> um, I begin this poem with a, an epigraph from the Canadian Civil Liberties Association that reads as follows. Slaps or strategic lawsuits against participation, public participation, are lawsuits or the threat of a lawsuit directed against individuals or organizations in order to silence and deter their public criticisms and advocacy for change. Slap. Did justice consent to her blindfold or tie it herself, little slut, asking for it in every courthouse? Count at least one of each in every room. A white man carrying a weapon and a grudge. B, a rapist gathering your public body. The body you are given, never yours, but a rentable target for buckshot or death. Look away for the impact. What good is a slap in a knife fight? What good is a defense when the body is already harmed beyond action? Too little, too legal, too late. The only sucker offered to the silenced is the chance to cut our own tongues before others cut them from us to display as proof, as legal precedence, as slander. Speech is free only to those who can afford the brace of custom leather muzzles fitted to the mouths they forced and tore. Scold's bridle. Too little, too legal too tight on the face. Bleached white leather cuts into the cheeks, reflects cataracts in the eyes, sick white glow. The eyes weep their own jelly in protest, laborious pull of a stillbirth, tectonic ache against these forced extractions. What more can they take who have plundered scraped wounds? What more can they take who have taken us what more can they take who have killed and claimed victimhood? What good is a rape shield and a death match? 
hollow shell against our naming that dissolves in precedence. A thousand defamation suits playing at Adam, naming us to death, renaming us as corpses. Jane Doe, Jane Doe, Jane Roe, Jane Doe, Jill Roe, Jane Doe, bodies, bodies, bodies to be taken. How to hold a body when the bodies multiply, frozen and vivisected. How to fight for body with its last breaths labeled libel. Justice is the final score they make of us, the waste of time, too little, too larval, too late. Justice is a woman chopped and sued by her attacker. Justice is and 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 Thank you. Ellie Sawatsky. Ellie holds an MFA from the Creative Writing Program at UBC. She's a poet and writer originally from Kenora and now lives in Vancouver. The jurors described Ellie's lines as precise and coiled, catching and unraveling like breath. Please welcome Ellie to read from Unorganized Territory. Thank you. I can't believe I'm at a reading hosted by Sheila Rogers. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> um, I want to say, first of all, how grateful I am to be here. This is such a great honor. Um, it's been so wonderful to have met and connected with Rebecca and John and the fact that we all share a connection to the landscapes of northwestern Ontario, northern Ontario, um, is just so mysterious and magical. Um, I can't get over it. Thank you to the Writers' Trust and to Carolyn Smart, who called me with the good news while I was in Greece two months ago. And things were pretty good because I was in Greece, but, <laughs> but it just made it that much better, that much more, more special. Um, I'm so grateful to the jurors as well, all of whom are poets that I respect and admire and whose work has influenced my own. Um, and of course, a huge thank you to Brahman Wallace herself, who I'm sure is here in spirit. Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems from my shortlisted manuscript, which is a collection of seven poems called Unorganized Territory. And these seven poems are a part of my full length um, debut collection of poems that I've been working on, which is called None of This Belongs to Me, and which I'm planning to have finished writing by the end of June, because it's good to have self-imposed deadlines. <laughs> um, all the poems in this collection, in Unorganized Territory, were written pretty recently, um, and they're a product of the age that we live in with social media and dating apps and Google, and also my anxiety and apprehension surrounding the bizarreness and of these everyday, seemingly banal experiences and how they affect us psychologically and how they affect our relationships to other humans and to nature. Um, but on a positive note, <laughs> it's currently my favorite time of year, which is Gemini season. <laughs> so the first poem I'm going to read is called New Moon, Gemini Season. Someone on Instagram said, you can begin again. Across the city, the man I used to love is happy, likely, waxing metaphysical to his cats about the Illuminati. 
I'm feverish in bed, the internet feeding me little wisdoms. I don't believe in romance, a friend says in a text. And I protest. But these days, an ASM artist on YouTube pets me to sleep. The little boy I nanny says he sees ghosts. I guess I believe in unfinished business. Like when the big one shakes us, I imagine I'll be high on cough syrup, rolling bad 90s movies in my mind and wishing I could call my mother, but lately I just asked Google. At least I know I'm not the first person to have wondered anything. Wiki, how can I begin again if I'm still haunted? How do I make peace with my ex who believed the flat earth theory? <laughs> Fell asleep each night listening to lectures by a man known as Mr. Astrotheology. I hated that NASA loomed monstrous outside our house, that even love might have been a conspiracy. We circled each other for so many years. I saw my Saturn returning, and a so-called invisible anti-moon finally shadowed him from me. I'm wide awake now, even in sleep. I'm busy building catastrophes. Last night's nightmare, a gym floor littered with thumbtacks. Many barefoot children. But hope this evening is a post-Tinder codeine dream where I see two of me make love to each other while the earth quakes. I believe this is the beginning of something. Thank you. Um, the next poem that I'm going to read is called Kenora Unorganized, and it's the source of the collection's title. I wrote it this past winter while I was staying with my parents in my hometown, Kenora, Ontario. And an organized territory is any geographic region that doesn't make up part of a municipality. So when I'm in my childhood home, the Tinder app tells me that I'm in Null, Ontario. <laughs> and the weather app, my weather app on my phone tells me that I'm in Kenora, unorganized. So a few people pointed out to me how poetic that is, that that's where I'm from. So, this poem is about where I come from. Kenora unorganized. The pipes freeze, car won't start. Dad splits wood and mom conmaries the closets to make space for me. I borrow Sorel's shovel hopeless trenches through the unorganized territory of my childhood. This minus 50 has some mercy says CBC, meaning death, for larvae of the emerald ash borer, a pretty but evil invasive beetle that kills trees. Blessed is the junco at the feeder who's not supposed to be here this time of year. Blessed also the unlikely swallowtail butterfly found alive in a local man's garage. I've come here to collect stories from my ancestry, but I keep procrastinating. Watch my mind chase a jackrabbit across the frozen lake, which is a kind of cemetery. In Null, Ontario, you can hear the snap as tinder breaks. Radio waves roll into an empty sky. There's no one around you. Evening, I rewatch Matilda with my parents, remembering a man I once loved who wept passionately when we watched it together. He so believed in telekinesis. <laughs> Natural history, strange and miraculous, thistle seeds stirring under snow. Loneliness is its own magic, the way the earth makes room. Mom switches off lights so we can see the wolf moon turn red behind a quiet grove of ash trees. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. 
John Elizabeth Stincy is a non-binary writer and visual artist who, again, this Northern Ontario theme was raised on a cattle farm in Northwestern Ontario. The jurors said John's work is brave, brave and timely. Please welcome John to read from Selections from June Bat. <laughs> I don't know how I'm supposed to follow all those people. Um, so this is a poem that's from my manuscript in progress, which is called June Bat. And just for a little bit of context, if you haven't read the poems, a June Bat is something that I invented. So I don't think that you should have known what that is. But it's basically a, an invention of that most crudely can be used to represent a sort of a non-binary identity. It's a little bit more than that, but, but that'll be helpful, I think. So this is the last poem in my, in my package, and it's, you know, a poem about the bad voice that's in my head. So it's called Evidence Disproving the Existence of June Bats. Firstly, and frankly conclusively, neither the chronologist nor the chiropterologist has heard of a June bat. Therefore, there is no June bat to even be Furthermore, that your mother and your father call you son, that your brothers call you brother, that people on the street call you sir, because you are nearly alone in thinking anything different, that you have written a whole novel from the voice of a character who could be called a June bat. A novel is fiction, therefore you cannot be a June bat because it is fictional. That you don't correct the woman who has the extra black bow, hair bow when she's talking to the person you're sitting with at this book launch at 7 a.m. on a weekday in an Econo Lodge near Times Square, who's hoping to find someone wearing all black to give it to. And so this person you just met gestures to you because you're wearing all black, and you gesture to yourself and smile, and she replies laughing, but he is a boy, and you do not correct her. And she is right. You are not a June bat. That sometimes you look at yourself in the mirror and you do not hate your facial hair or your flat chest or your cock. That you do not correct anyone who assumes different now that I think of it. Also, don't even get me started on how you rarely even think about your cock. This is more, frankly, conclusive evidence. If you have a cock, you are your cock. June bats, which do not exist, do not have cocks because cocks exist and June bats do not. That you sometimes look at women on the path train and feel a desire to be loved by them, but also somewhat be them? So what? More sex wouldn't hurt you. Being someone else who does not think of themselves as a June bat would also not hurt you. That you feel deep sadness when someone at your new job comments that the notebook you have is pretty, then apologizes right away because she thinks you're going to be offended by that, but you say, thank you, I bought it because it was pretty. This has nothing to do with June bats. You are simply a depressed person. <laughs> that you write troubling things, insinuating a desire to cease to exist in the visual journal you are keeping alongside some exceedingly troubling drawings. This is not June batness. You are very sick. Seek help. That while having sex you've never quite felt right has nothing to do with June bats. Dissociation during sex is recommended. Or maybe you're gay. Gayness is real now. Experiment. <laughs> that you sign those journal entries with a compound name between your name and a girl name. This is because you're, you're trying to depersonalize your own depression, to make your depression exist outside of your body, which you know is male, and there is nowhere farther from your body than the body of a female. In short, you are not a June bat. That biology simply doesn't work that way. Read a textbook, get a therapist, one that doesn't humor your June bat talk like your current therapist does. Assuming, for argument's sake, that a June bat is real, it's clear you aren't one because you're featured in a short documentary that someone does about what could be construed as a June bat organization. And when the short documentary is shared by the org on Instagram, the post talking about is a series of clips of the people who are featured in the documentary and the caption says, click to see the link 
click the link in our bio to see a short documentary featuring some members of our community. You are not featured in the Instagram post. Therefore, you are not considered a part of their June Bat community. Therefore, you are not a June Bat. That this post convinced you you were not a June Bat for a long time. Return to that frame of mind. Build a house. And that you have only recently begun to think of it, to identify as a June Bat. Impossible. It is impossible that you are only now coming to this conclusion. You are born and you are the way you were born. If you were a June bat, you would need to be born a June bat. Your first words would need to be, I am a June bat. Otherwise, psychosis. Otherwise, too much time spent online. Go outside. Go talk to someone in a bar. Go wander around Hoboken on a game night or a weekend night. Do you see June bats there? Do you? If June bats exist and they are nocturnal, you should see them. If you survive here and, for the sake of argument, are a June bat, this place should be June bat habitat. So why are there not more of you? There should be. There would be. It doesn't matter that you loosely called yourself a June bat years before. It is a fad. I get it. We were all emo kids once. Or goth. Or cool. We grow out of things. June bat is just the new goth. You are online too much. Go outside. Use a public bathroom and make a choice and stick with it. If you want to stand, there you go. If you want to sit, sit on the knife and go all in. It is really not that hard to understand. Blue and pink are very very different colors. They were picked for a reason, Adam and also Eve. It doesn't matter that one was made from the other. Not every Adam has some Eve inside. Go outside. Stop reading into everything so deeply. It's okay to not be a June bat. That doesn't make you boring. Being a June bat is worse than being boring because it is not real. There is no such thing as a June bat. Counterpoint. I am still everything I think. I am not. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another round for all three of our stars? Do you know what time it is? It is. It's true. Time to reveal the winner. And to make the announcement, please welcome Amy Cairncross, Senior Vice President of Communications from RBC. Thank you for that kind introduction, Sheila. On behalf of RBC, it is my privilege to be here this evening to recognize and celebrate the authors named in this year's finalists for the RBC Bronwyn Wallace Award for Emerging Writers. This award shines a spotlight on some of Canada's most talented developing writers and has a track record for discovering and promoting the brightest young writers in our country. Literature is such an important part of our national fabric. It inspires us and enriches the communities in which we live. At RBC, we care about investing in the places where we live and work. It's core to our purpose of helping clients thrive and communities prosper. Our support of the arts has been a long-standing priority as we recognize the arts play an important role in building that vibrant community and strong economies. An important part of this commitment is helping emerging artists to bridge the gap from emerging to established. Launched in 2007, the RBC Emerging Artists Project is our multi-year commitment to supporting the development of emerging artists through mentoring programs, education, providing access and exposure to new audiences, and facilitating award programs like the one we're celebrating this evening. We acknowledge the hard work and tremendous dedication of the young writers who are being recognized as finalists. Rebecca, Ellie and John, congratulations to each of you for earning the distinguished honor. What a tremendous achievement. You can now join an accomplished list of writers who have enhanced Canadian literature through their unique voices and impressive talent.
And on behalf of all of us in the room tonight, I wish you each continued success in your literary careers. And now, to announce the winner of the 2019 Bronwyn Wallace Award for Emerging Writers. Congratulations to John Elizabeth Stinsey. and literary community and the entire audience here this evening, congratulations to you for this incredible contribution and we wish you very, the very, very best in your future as you continue your passion for writing. Thank you. I never expected I'd be back up on this stage so soon. Um, I don't really have a, a, much of a. Sp I have some like notes because I was like, you know, you know, just in case, you know, just you never know. Uh, but I want to start by, you know, thanking Rebecca and Ellie for sharing the space with me. It's been a, a really wonderful time. I want to thank everyone from the trust for making this so stress free. Aside from you know the stress they couldn't control, which you know. Is to Totally fine, you know, it's been wonderful. I want to thank RBC and everyone who's, you know, contributed. All my friends for coming, all my friends who wanted to come but couldn't come. Um, oh, I don't even know if I want to say any of this. Um, you know, all right, let's, let's see what I can, what I can pull out. Um, I firmly believe that being a writer mostly involves not stopping. Uh, and I just want to say that I'm very lucky that I was one of the, you know, many writers like Rebecca and Ellie who were able to sort of push through and continue to sort of work in this way. I've known many people, you know, throughout, I've been writing since I was 16 years old. You wouldn't want to see anything from when I was 16 years old, but I was doing it. Uh, very, it's awful, but, you know, every step of the way I, I've always felt like there were people that were better than me. And, and I've, you know, I, I kept doing it despite that. And then, you know, as I was sort of, you know, going into college, I was still writing. And then I was meeting all these people in my creative writing classes that were better than me. And I was like, well, okay, this is, you know, this is just how it's going to be, you know. And then years later, you sort of look back and you see how many of these people that were, like, writing really great stuff just, you know, end up, you know, falling away and not continuing. And I think that really... You know, most of what has brought me here today is that I'm just stubborn, you know. I just, just kept doing it. Like, I was never always the best writer, and I just sort of... But I just... There was something in me that kept doing it. And I, there was all these people that were supporting me and saying, you know, oh, you should keep doing this. Even when I was, like, 16, people were saying that I should keep... I don't know what they were thinking, but I'm glad that they were. You know, it's just amazing to think that... I'm mostly here because some people decided to take some time and say, I, this is, you're saying something and don't stop, you know, even when it was terrible, like even when I was writing, when I was writing terrible stuff, you know, like thinking back and just knowing all the people that haven't been able to continue to write or they come back to writing really late, like I've, I feel so blessed to have been, you know, be able to be a young emerging writer because I've just been so lucky and I haven't, I haven't been able to put in the time that other people I know cannot do and I, I really um, I really appreciate and I'm grateful that I've been able to do that um, so finally I would just like to thank my friends and family who were able to come tonight and all everyone else who I've never met and who hopefully I will meet that came out tonight and everyone who couldn't come out tonight and wanted to um, I'd like to especially thank my parents uh, Mark and Marjorie Cincy if you're on Twitter, you might be know my mother. Um, <laughs> and my partner, Melanie, of course. And, and my friends, Brooke and Austin, for coming from Buffalo, which is also really cool. So, you know, and yeah, I just, that's it. I don't know. Thank you.
congratulations to our winner, to the nominees. Um, I know Carolyn's very moved by all three of you, and uh, this is a really exciting event and a wonderful evening. Congratulations to the three of you. So, <laughs> that's it. Um, please stay with us. I believe Rafi is going to play, and the wine is going to pour, and that's great. And you can pick up your copy of the booklet featuring Rebecca, Ellie, and John's uh, poems as you leave. Thank you so, so very much for coming out and celebrating the 25th anniversary of the RBC Bronwyn Wallace Prize for Emerging Writers. Thanks for having